if you don't realize it, I'm pointing it out to you. The stuff that happens here has the potential to affect the world. Officially, right now on the schedule, we have a step workshop. We're going to talk about the steps in an hour. All the steps in an hour. How many weeks do you say that your, your Zoom step uh, meeting is? 20, 28, 28 weeks. 28 weeks. If you're looking for a really good GA step meeting online, there's a 28-week one that Bill runs, and... Uh, Ask Rabbi Zalman for information how to, how to get on that Zoom, okay? All right, so we're going to do the steps in one hour. But I'm going to structure it. I'm going to condense it into a structure that I think will make it doable. You may be aware of the fact that Dr. Bob was asked to simplify the program to simplify the steps. And he said, well, you could really condense it all into three steps. Trust God, clean house, help others. When you think about it, it makes sense because like the first three steps are the God steps, trust God, right? So that's the admission of powerlessness and the uh, came to believe and uh, made a decision. So that's first three steps, that's trust God. And then starting with step four is the inventory and take you all the way to what? The, all the way to 11, which is prayer meditation. And those, that's basically clean house. That includes all the finding your character defects and surrendering your character defects and making amends, eight and nine. But basically four through 11 is, is clean house. And then 12 is help others. As a result of these steps, what do we do? We uh, carry the message. I like the original version, by the way, of the steps. I don't know if people are aware of this, but the original draft did not say carry the, this message to other alcoholics. It was just to carry this message to anyone, everyone. Why should you limit it? But then they decided, you know, let's dial it back a little bit and then just said, carry the message to other alcoholics. But really, if it's a spiritual message, why not, why not say it to anyone you meet? It's, it's their choice whether they want to listen. At any rate, so that's, that's really, you know, the, the steps. is three steps. Trust God, clean house, help others. That's it. That's it. Very simple. Okay. Now, Passover is coming. And I understand not everyone here is Jewish, and that's fine but I'm just going to use Passover as the way to structure my talk so I don't bore you. And I'm sure you're going to be okay with that. Um, it's interesting that the process of redemption from slavery, which is a... Redemption from slavery is an idea that should be relevant to anybody in recovery. It's not Egyptian servitude, it's the bondage of self. And then God does for us what we could not do for ourselves. So the process of redemption from slavery is a three-step process. And in fact, it's broken down in a verse by King Solomon, who was the wisest of all men, in his Song of Songs. A lot of people read Song of Songs, and they're like, oh, that's a racy poem about romance. Song of Songs is a metaphor. It's an extended metaphor. And it uses imagery of romantic love. But it's actually a romance between God and his people. So it's the ultimate romance. It's a holy romance. And I'll just... Nowadays, we don't use books anymore. Everything is electronic. Okay. Um, let me just pull it up. Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 4. I'm going to read a little Hebrew. Don't get... 
If you went to yeshiva, don't get triggered by the Hebrew. The Gentiles are like, Hebrew, cool. The yeshiva bacham are like, <laughs> cool it, rabbi. <laughs> okay, listen, listen. It's all good. It's all safe. Don't worry. Just one verse. I'm just going to read one verse. Mashchini. Draw me. Draw me doesn't mean like draw a picture of me. Pull me. Pull me up. Who's speaking? To whom? We are speaking to God. And we say to our beloved, Mashchini, pull me up. Pull me up. Pull me out of here. Acharecha nerutza. We will run after you. Haviani melech chadorov. The king has brought me into his innermost chambers. That's it. That's it. Three stages. Moshchein, draw me, pull me up. We will run after you. Haviani melech chadorov. The king has brought me into his innermost chambers. That's the three stages. These three phrases are three phases. Three, fa three phrases, three phases of redemption, of a spiritual awakening, of going from rock bottom to happy, joyous, and free. And it breaks it down very, very simple. And in fact, I'm not going to get too technical here, but it also corresponds to three months. You know, in the Bible, it doesn't refer to the months by names. The Hebrew names of the months is a later development. In the actual Bible, in the Torah, it refers to the months by numbers. So the first month is called Chodesh Parishon, which literally means the first month. Yeah first month. And then the second month is called the second month. And the third month is called the third month. That's a very good. You got, it's not a trick question. Okay. So the first month is the month of redemption. The month of the exodus. The second month is the month after that month. And the third month was when these former slaves stood at Sinai, at Mount Sinai, and experienced divine revelation. The Ten Commandments, the giving of the Torah. Three phases. Three months. Three phrases. Three steps. And that's what we're going to do to make it really simple to go through the steps, the 12 steps in an hour. And we only have like 50 minutes left because it just took 10 minutes explaining what we're going to do instead of doing it. We're going to, get, we're going to, we're going to manage to fit it all in because we're going to make it simple. We're going to fit it into these three categories. Okay. Let's talk about the first, the first phase. What in King Solomon's verse is described as Mashcheni, draw me, pull me. Pull me up, pull me out of here. Why do we say to God, pull me out of here? You know why? Because we've realized that human power is of no avail. We cannot get ourselves out of here. And so we surrender and we make ourselves available <clears throat> to God pulling us out. You know what it means to be stuck? Being stuck doesn't mean I know how to get out of here. I, I'm just not ready to get out yet. That's being comfortable. Stuck is... No, I want to get out. I'm working really, really hard to get out. It's a full-time job trying to get out. And every single thing I do to get out digs me deeper. And the harder I try, the more dysfunctional my life becomes. 
like those Chinese finger traps. The more you pull, the tighter it gets. Or like quicksand, the more you struggle, the more you fall in. That's what stuck means. Stuck means not just that my human power isn't helpful. My human power is counterproductive. My schemes, my plans are making it worse. A guy once called me up. He said, um, I want to ask you a question about sobriety. And uh, he says, he says, I'm in program for two years. And when they say I'm in program for two years, like you understand, in program, what does that mean? Like taking up a seat at a meeting for two years? It could be. I don't, it doesn't tell me where he's at in his sobriety. So I said, okay, you're in program. I don't know what that means other than you went to your first meeting two years ago. How much time do you have? So he says, I would have had three months a week ago. <laughs> when they start doing math, you know you're in trouble. So I'm like, so you have a week. <laughs> in other words, you have a week. So I said, let me ask you a different question. What step are you on? It's in program for two years. What step are you on? So he says, well, my sponsor told me to take a break from the steps <laughs> while I get my life in order. I said, step one is you admitted that you can't get your life in order. <laughs> so you're still trying to get your life in order. That means you're still in active addiction. You're still in the insanity phase. You're not in recovery. You're in addiction. I said, by the way, this sponsor told you to take a break from the steps. Like, why did he tell you that? He said, like, don't worry. He's a very good sponsor. He has me call him every day. I said, what do you talk about with him every day? You're not even doing step work. <clears throat> so step one is I, I admitted... I tried everything that normally should work. And it didn't work. And the solution is not the marriage counselor or the credit counselor or the attorney or the doctor or the psychiatrist. None of those things work. In fact, all of them added to the chaos. So clearly, I'm not capable of getting myself out of here. And by the way, do you know that in the 210 years that our people were in Egypt, not one slave successfully left. There were attempts. Not one slave. When they left, there were 600,000 heads of household. So that means millions of people. Statistically, you'd think at least one would slip past the fence. Not one slave made it out of Egypt. In fact, that's why we say, oh, where's the, uh, do you have my Haggadah? Every Zalman will get my Haggadah. You're about to be famous if you walk in front of the camera. <laughs> okay, I want to I get the Haggadah real quick. Can you get a read? How, how much time do I have to stall? It's right here, okay. So in the Haggadah, it actually says, we were slaves, give me the page, please. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. And if God had not taken us out of there, we would still be, us and our children would still be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Can I ask you a question? This is thousands of years ago. We would still be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. There is no Pharaoh in Egypt. What is that even talking about? Perfect page. But, but, okay. This is the, uh, the, the Four Cups Haggadah came out a couple years ago. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. And God, our God, took us out of there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. And if God had not taken us out of Egypt, 
Hare anu v'neinu, or v'nei v'neinu. We and our children and our grandchildren, Mushubotim, Hoinu l'fadu b'mitraim, would still be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. You want to know why? Because you could have literally given us 3,000 years to work on this project with human effort and we would still be there. So how much time you need to get your life in order based on human power? You need a few months? Not going to happen in a few millennia, let alone in a few months. When you're stuck, that means you cannot get out. Human power is ineffective. And by the way, if you've got a problem that can be solved with human power, that's great. I don't wish on anybody that they should be in a situation where they feel helpless. I mean, it's actually a hidden blessing. That's how you find God. But I don't wish it on anybody. If somebody tells me they went through their whole life never needing to rely on God, I don't begrudge them that. That's fine. I don't wish that they should have a a crisis and hit bottom. Why should I wish that on somebody? But if you are a person who is truly ever in Egypt, Egypt in the Bible is called Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim means narrow places, strictures. It means where you're stuck, you're squeezed. And you're being squeezed and you can't get out. And the more you try to get out, the more you get squeezed. And you had to learn that the only way out is to surrender. Okay? So then, now you're at step one. So that's the first phase. Mashcheni, King Solomon says, draw me out of here. Draw me out of here means I admit I can't take myself out. God can take me out. Only God can take me out. Tell you something interesting also. when we celebrate the anniversary of when God did for us what we could not do for ourselves and took us out of Egypt, we eat matzah. And one of the reasons that we eat matzah, it says over here, let's see how quickly I can find the right page. One of the reasons that we, uh, oh, I think I found it. Yeah. Matzah zoo. It's on page 68 of uh, Four Cups of Gone. Matzah zu, this matzah, shanu eichlim, that we eat, al shumo. Why do we eat it? Al shum shalai hispik patzakas shal avesenu lahachnitz. Because the dough of our ancestors did not have time to rise. Achid nigla le malach machem lochem ekadish baruchu golam. Before the Holy One, blessed be He, King of all kings, revealed Himself to them and redeemed them. What's the story here? Story means like this. When redemption came, it came so abruptly, we didn't even have time to allow the dough to finish rising. 210 years were in servitude and couldn't get out and wanted out. And yet when the moment came, we didn't even have time for our bread to rise. You know why? Because our getting out in the end was not the result of our human effort. It wasn't something we'd worked on and therefore we were prepared for. It was something that happened to us, not in our timeline, but in God's timeline. And when it did happen, we had no choice but just to surrender to it and go along for the ride. You cannot plan the date when your new life begins. I've seen plenty of people try it. I'm going to go for one more week. Got a good trip coming up with my friends, and right when I come back, that's going to be my, my new first 24 hours. You can't schedule these things. A lady once called me. She told me that her husband finally hit bottom, and it was decided that inpatient was the right thing for him. And she said... But the problem is, the only time they have a spot, meaning unless I want to wait for like another few months, I would have to let him go on the first day of Passover. So she says, interesting, she's calling, not him. Okay, but that's, that's, 
They didn't talk about uh, the disease of codependency. So she says, and by the way, this is a lady who was crying to me for years about her husband being out of control. And now he's ready to go. He's ready to go. She says, now she's putting the brakes on. She says, but first day that they have a bed for him, unless he wants to wait three more months, would be the first day of Passover. So I'm feeling like maybe he should just go, you know, better stay home with the kids, family, we'll celebrate Passover together, and then afterwards, then he'll go. I said, you're going to ce- celebrate Passover? She says, yeah. I said, at your Passover celebration, you're going to have matzah. She said, yeah. I said, and when you eat that matzah, you're going to read from the Haggadah, you're going to read from this text that it says we eat the matzah to symbolize the fact that when indeed the time came of our, for our liberation, we didn't even have time to tell God, hold on a second, just wait another few minutes and the bread will be ready. And you're turning to God and you're saying, when the window finally opened, and you all, we all know that window closes. The window of sanity, of willingness, is open. And you're going to turn to God and say, hold on a second, God. We've got a nice uh, family dinner called Passover coming up. We want the kids to be together, the grandkids. And, you know, and afterwards, God, we'll, we'll get back to you on our time. When it works for us. When it works for us. Can you imagine if the Jews in Egypt would tell God, hold on a second. Bread is still rising. You know what? Better. Let's, we'll, we'll let the bread rise. We'll do some laundry. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get stuff in order. Get check, check back with us tomorrow. In fact, you know what? I don't want to feel rushed. Let's do it a week from How about a week from Can we pencil you in for a week from now? But we don't say that. You know why? Because when the moment of redemption arrives, it is so clear that you have no right and no ability to say when and how it should happen or what rate it should happen because it's clearly not you doing it it's happening to you it is grace it is a gift and you are not calling the shots you are surrendering that's what king solomon means draw me just pull me out i'm surrendering i'm letting you take me we did not remove ourselves from egypt we were removed by a power greater than ourselves. They did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Not in thousands of years, we still wouldn't be able to do it for ourselves. So that's the first phase. And that's the first three steps. Mission of powerlessness. Came to believe in a power. He restored us to sanity. We made a decision. Surrender. Turn our lives and wills over to the care of God. And it's really actually, um, it's, a, it's, it's very different. It's in contrast with the way that life's been up until that point. Because up until that point, you know, active addiction is hard work. It's a full-time job. So you're working hard. You're working hard. And where, when redemption comes, it's almost like, oh, now... Just relax, because you're not in control anymore. It's so counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive. You mean, now I just do nothing? Right, do nothing. Please do nothing. Because when you do something, (laughs) all your best ideas are making everything worse. Do nothing. Okay, great. So that's the first of the three phases. First three steps of the 12 steps. And that's the first month of the first three months. First month is redemption. Just pull us out of here. Okay. Are we done with the process? No, we're, we're not done. Right, because I said it's the first phase of three phases. So we're not done. Okay. All right. So now we're free. For now. But we know we need to get to work. What do you mean get to work? You told me to surrender. I did. But now you're going to get to work in a totally new way. You're going to follow instructions. You're going to do what you're told. You're not going to think too much. You're going to keep it simple. 
and you're going to start phase two, which is, we said, Dr. Bob said, trust God. Okay, we did that, phase one. Second phase, clean house. Okay, now we're going to clean house. So clean house is steps four through 11, like we said. So you're going to write your inventory, and you're going to read that inventory to somebody, and you're going to see the exact nature of your wrongs. You're going to see your character defects in bold relief. Then you're going to surrender those character defects, six and seven. Then you're going to figure out who got hurt because of your character defects, eight. And you're going to go to those people and make it right with them, nine. And then you're going to make sure that you don't build up new garbage after you just cleaned house, that's 10. And you're going to pray and meditate every day, 11. Clean house, clean your house, clean your house. That's phase two. So phase two, how did King Solomon describe it? Phase one was Moshcheni, pull me out of here. Phase two was Acharecha Nerutza, we will run after you. See what shifted? From passive to active. In the first phase, Moshcheni, draw me out of here, it's passive, because it has to be passive, it's surrender. God is active, I am passive in phase one. Phase two, Acharecha Nerutza, we will run after you, now I'm active. Now I'm active. But not active in the old way, where in active addiction, I'm active, but I'm just digging the pit d- deeper and deeper. Okay, now it's on God's terms, so now my work is actually productive. And the work that I'm doing is the house cleaning. Looking at my fears and my resentments, harm's done, house cleaning. That's the work that I'm doing now. In terms of the Hebrew calendar, the second month is the month of what we call Sfiras HaOimer. Sfiras HaOimer is a process of counting down the days between the Exodus and the Revelation at Sinai. It's actually 49 days. And it's not just counting days, but those who are familiar with this with this. Uh, practice know that each day we examine another aspect of our personality and make it right and align it with God's will. So the house cleaning process, in fact, sphero means counting, but it also, sapir means like a sapphire, it means like a, a shiny stone. So it's like polishing, polishing your personality getting a new personality, a godly personality. So what happens during that phase is that we start to look at the deep, dark, scary stuff. The the dysfunction the twists of character and we and we deal with it it's interesting there's another difference between the first and second phase the way King Solomon describes it I highlighted one difference is that it goes from passive to active but there's another difference see if you can spot it first phase Moshchein draw me Second phase, Acharech and Rutza, we will run after you. So I said, it goes from being drawn, where it's happening to you, it's passive, to running, it's active. But tell me what other change happened between those two phrases. Draw me, we will run after you. Me to we, singular to plural. What happened? Higher self, lower self. In phase one, Only my higher self is engaged. God rescues me by engaging my higher self. My lower self is still just as crazy and messed up. I haven't started house cleaning. I I I didn't write an inventory. 
Okay, so I have serenity because I did the first three steps. I'm still crazy. I just know not to be dumb and try to run my own life. So I'm still crazy, but I know not to run my own life, so I'm not doing new damage. But how do I get uncrazy? How do I address my lower self? Well, that's the house cleaning steps. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Fears, resentments, harms done. Clean it all up. And don't be afraid to look at any of it. Clean it all up. Now, it's interesting because <laughs> you say, oh, I got to clean up my lower self. Why didn't I do that first? Why didn't I do that first? What do you say? In fact, if I try to clean it up first before the surrender, like we said, when I'm still in Egypt, all my efforts not only are failures, they are counterproductive. So it's like the addict who goes to therapy to deal with their addiction. I'm not saying therapy is not helpful. I'm just saying when you're in active addiction and you try to use talk therapy as a replacement for recovery, or better yet, the people who go into the rooms and try to use the meeting as free therapy and are not working steps and are not surrendering and are not looking for a higher power and just there to talk about taking their cat to the vet. So what happens? I get sicker. So I can't clean house while I'm still in Egypt. There's an order for a reason. You can't do 4 through 11 and then 1, 2, 3. There's an order for a reason. First is 1, 2, 3. Mashcheni, draw me. Take me out of here, God, because I can't. Now you surrendered? Great. Now you're going to look at your lower self, and you're going to start cleaning it. And when you start to clean the lower self, now you have higher self and lower self, plural. We, we will run after you. We. And by the way, these two differences are related. I said the difference between passive and active, and then I said the difference between singular and plural. They're related. I'll tell you how they're related. When you recognize the character defects and you surrender them, you do know what happens, don't you? It's not that you're left without a personality. All the things that you were good at before recovery, you'll still be good at. You'll just be able to do them for fun and for free. You'll be able to do them to bring glory to your maker. You'll be able to do them to make other people's lives better. Instead of using the things that you're good at, to just get yourself out of trouble and figure out how to get what you want. So when you surrender the character defects, it's not like you're left naked and bare and you have nothing. Well, maybe temporarily, and you have to be ready to be naked and bare of a, of a personality for a moment. But what happens is you start getting it back, but you get it back on God's terms. So if you were a smart person before, and you used to use your smartness in a sick way to manipulate people, so you're giving up your smartness and say, God, if you never want me to be smart again, I'm ready to never be smart again. And then God gives you back your smartness and says, no, I want you to be smart again, but on my terms. All the smartness, the way you figured out how to manipulate people, I want you to use your smartness to figure out how to help people. So the we and the running are connected because when the lower self is engaged, after the house cleaning process, after the lower self becomes cleansed, now you're running. Running means you're progressing at a pace that you couldn't if you hadn't brought the lower self on board. So there's this infusion, there's this turbo boost that you get when you're able to go back and get your personality back, but now it's like God's personality instead of your personality. Well, how, how do I explain this? You develop a personality 
probably based on what you're good at already, but you used your personality, well, basically when you're a kid, you're just trying to feel safe. And so you figure out what gets people off your back. So some of us learn how to be clever and manipulative. Some of us learn how to be scary and aggressive. Some of us learn how to be invisible and just disappear so nobody knows what you're doing. We all develop different skills. These are skills, but they're all adaptations. They're all just ways that we're trying to survive as kids. And then you get really, really good at that, and it becomes your personality. And then when you find your drug of choice, it becomes a full-time job to maintain active addiction. So all of those skills, whatever they are, become enlisted in maintaining that lifestyle. And then you become really, really, really good at what you do until it ruins your life. And then you say, well, I can't be like this anymore. Okay, no problem. Surrender. God, I'm giving to you these defects of character. Take it. All right. But now what happens? What are you left with? What you're left with is that all of the things that you became good at for sick reasons, <laughs> you're still good at those things, and now you work for God. So go back to those things and just do it for him. My favorite recovery story is about the guy who's dry. It's in the book. I have it in the book. Got to understand it. Um, I heard it from a speaker. I didn't make it up. They say, all wisdom is plagiarized. Only stupidity is original. So. <laughs> There's a guy driving down the highway late at night, totally depressed. He says, I hate my life. I want to be sober. Can't get sober. God, give me sobriety. And when you know it, while he's in his car, God speaks to him and says, you're looking for sobriety? Good news. Sobriety is on sale today for a very reasonable price. The guy says, really? How much? God says, how much you got? The guy's like, I have 20 bucks on me. God says, oh, you're in luck because the price for sobriety is $20. He says, well, that's exactly what I've got. If I give you the $20, you're going to clean me out. The guy says, you see, I'm driving this car. Look at the, the gas gauge. is almost empty. I'm going to give you the $20. I'm going to have to put fuel in the car. I'm going to run out of gas. I can't really give up the 20 bucks." God says, oh, you, you make an excellent point. The price of sobriety today is $20 in your car. The guy says, God, if I give you my car, how am I going to get, how many, how am I going to, get to work in the morning? God says, oh, yeah, you have a job. I forgot about that. Yeah, the price for sobriety is $20, your car, and your job. The guy says, what? I give you my job? I mean, how am I going to pay the mortgage if I don't have a job? God says, oh, mortgage, that's right, you're a homeowner. Price for sobriety today is $20, your car, your job, and your house. The guy says, if I give you my house, where are my wife and children going to live? Oh, excellent point, God says. The price for sobriety today is $20, your car, your job, your house, your wife, your kids. At this point, the guy realizes he better shut up. <laughs> so he's not talking anymore. So God says, give it all. God takes it. And uh, God says, and one more thing before I give you your sobriety. Can you do something for me? The guy says, mm-hmm. He doesn't want to talk. He's afraid. He says, mm-hmm. God says, okay. See this $20? It's not your $20, God says. It's my $20. I took it. But I want you to spend it. It's not yours, but I want you to spend it. But because it's my $20, God says, when you spend it, you only can buy things that I want. Can you do that? The guy says, mm-hmm. God says, okay, see this car? You used to have a car just like this, didn't you? But you don't, God says, it's my car. But I want you to drive. But send your car. You're going to drive, but it's my car, God says. But since it's my car, when you drive, you can only go where I want to go. God says, see this uh, job? Not your job, God says. It's my job now. But I want you to show up there every day and do business the way that I want business done. You see, this house, God says, not your house, it's my house. But I want you to live in it. But you can only live in it and use it the way God's house ought to be used. 
see this wife and children, this beautiful family. They're not your wife and children. God says, they're my wife and children. And I want you to treat them the way that God's wife and children ought to be treated. Can you do all of that for me? The guy says, "Mm mm-hmm. God says, good. So here's your $20. Here's your car. Here's your job. Here's your house. Here's your wife and children. And here's your sobriety. In other words, at the end, he gets back everything that he had in his old life. The only difference is ownership. Who does it belong to? So character defects, personality traits, they're only sick because we were using them selfishly. But once we surrender to God and say, it's not me. God, take it from me. If you never want me to be funny again, let's say my thing is I'm funny. But I realized it's ruining my life. Okay, if I'm never supposed to be funny ever again, God, it's your will. And God says to you, great, I'm glad that you're ready to make that sacrifice. And guess what? I need you to be funny for me, not for you. Not so you can crack a joke that'll get you out of trouble or get you closer to your... uh, to your drug of choice. I want you to be funny because I know there's a newcomer who you're going to meet and he's only going to respond if he meets somebody who cracks a good joke. So in phase two, we will run after you. We will, we will run after you means that the lower self, the personality, has now been won over to the side of the higher self, working in concert together to serve God, to be aligned with His will. And now we're running. We're not just walking. We're running. Think of all the progress you can make when you're working as hard at your recovery as you worked at your addiction. That's what happens. Okay. But then we've got a third phase. Still not done, right? Still not done. What's the third phase? So, Moshcheni, draw me out of here. Passive surrender, I can't do it, but you can. Start cleaning the house. Get the lower self engaged. Now we're running. Haviani Melech Chadarov. The king has brought me into his innermost chamber. The king has brought me into his innermost chamber. What does that mean, the king has brought me into his innermost chamber? That means vital spiritual experience or spiritual awakening. Or as the uh, appendix says, of the educational variety, which means it comes on incrementally. It doesn't have to be a thunderbolt. But the point is, The king has brought me into his innermost chamber. My life is an ongoing spiritual experience. You know, you ask ask somebody who's really, really, really sober. Really sober. Did you ever have a spiritual experience? You know what the answer is? Having one right now. Having one right now. What's not a spiritual experience? I like the famous saying of the Kotzker Rav, who was a great Hasidic master. They asked him, where is God? He said, wherever you let him in. What's not a spiritual experience? Everything's a spiritual experience. And being that you are having an ongoing spiritual experience, the purpose of life becomes, it's no longer about yourself. The purpose of life becomes how you can be there to be useful to others. That's the third phase. The third phase is when we stood at Sinai and God revealed himself to a nation of former slaves and said and now 
perhaps in spite of the trauma that you've been through or maybe because of the trauma you've been through, I need you now to be a light unto the nations. You've got a job. You work for me. No more self-pity. I don't, want you, I don't want to hear you crying about 210 years in Egypt. I need you to get to work. I need you to spread this message to the whole world. An ongoing spiritual experience, an ongoing life of usefulness. The same thing, it's synonymous, the same thing. And that's, that's step 12. And like I said, originally the draft, the original draft of the big book did not say to carry this this message to the other alcoholics. It just said carry the message. And in my humble opinion, that message is so much more important today than ever because the world is kind of crazy. And those who have found sanity in recovery and maybe because you were sicker than everybody else. It doesn't matter. There's no shame in that. I mean, if you... It, <laughs> once the ninth step promises start coming true, you know, we will not regret the past. I wish to shut the door on it. So yeah, maybe I'm more sane because I was more sick. Fine, that's my story. You know, whatever. No shame in that. But the point is, if you are sober and you are happy, joyous, and free... You've got a responsibility to the world, not just to the newcomer, not just to somebody who's still suffering because of whatever addiction you happen to have been redeemed from. But you have a duty to the world. And that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that you have to scare people off and talk like a zealot and come on strong. You all, you all know that You have to respect people's process, and you have to understand some people just aren't ready today. Some people, you know, tell you, Rabbi Zalman, remember, I'm saying remember, but you probably do this still now, because I'm remembering when I was a yeshiva bacher, but this is, you you never really graduated from this. When I was a yeshiva bacher, what would we do on Friday afternoons? They would close the lights in yeshiva, and we have to take our tefillin out on the street corner and stop strangers, just complete strangers. Excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? Would you like to put on tefillin? We wrap tefillin on them. You probably stand on camera and still do that. Okay, all right. For me, I'm more civilized now. I only do it with an appointment. Could I come over to your office, put on tefillin? But in the, in the old days, I used to do the guerrilla style. Yeah, yeah. Like, you're on campus, I'm sure you still do it. I want to tell you something. There's plenty of times when we would say, excuse me, sir, you're Jewish, would you like to put on tefillin? And the guy would be like, no, no. And I once heard something really, really helped me. A, a teacher of mine said, stop being so self-consumed. It's not about whether you got a yes or not. You're not a door-to-door salesman working on commission." Your job is to offer it. And maybe this guy needs to say no to 254 people before he says yes to guy number 255. And you are guy number 253, and you'll never know it. You'll never know the rest of the story. And I think it's the same thing when it comes to the 12th step that there may be somebody who needs to be offered recovery a thousand times before it's their time. And maybe you are the person who offered it time number 823. And so you will never see any fruits for your labor. But that's not your problem. That's not your calculation to make. You have to offer it. You have to offer it. Why? At the very least, because we know that by giving away what we were freely given, that's the best way to take out insurance on our own recovery. So obviously, 
you don't lose anything by offering it even if the other person declines. But I'll, I'll tell you even more. I really do believe that the world has gotten so sick that it's ready to start getting better. <laughs> and I see pockets of it starting to get better already. Pockets of sand. And I really do believe that the people from the rooms of recovery are going to be instrumental in this next phase of world history. I do believe that we're heading into a phase of awakening, of truth, of sobriety. I don't just mean chemical sobriety. I mean emotional sobriety. I mean, no longer playing God, but letting God be God. And the people who discovered that higher power because of their own personal Egypt experience are major players in that happening. So when you go back, you know, if you traveled here, I know a lot of people traveled here, Somebody said they came all the way from Maine. We're in Kansas right now, if you're watching on YouTube. Okay, we're in Kansas. I know you can't tell the background. That barn door could be anywhere. Well, it's in Kansas. When you go back to wherever you go back to, just remember this. Every single person you meet, that meeting was orchestrated by your loving and all-powerful maker. And if you meet somebody, it's for a reason. It's always for a reason. It may be somebody you're in an elevator with for 10 seconds. It may be an Uber driver. Maybe a friend or a relative. Maybe a coworker. Maybe a cashier at the grocery store. But keep your eyes and ears open. Because there are people literally sending you signals that they want to hear a message of truth. They want to hear a message of hope. They're desperate for it. And God sent you to be their person. When we're self-absorbed, self-consumed, fighting our own demons then there's no way we'll notice the other person who needs our help. We can't notice anybody. We can't be useful to anybody. But after you've had your spiritual experience or spiritual awakening, the whole point of it is now you're able to show up and be present in reality and see things. And what does it mean to see things? Primarily, seeing things means to notice the person who needs help. And it doesn't mean to become a codependent and think it's your job to get them help no matter what. It means it's your job to offer it because maybe you're guy 823 and they need a thousand people before they're ready. But you need to offer it. You need to see that they are asking for it. You need to offer it. And don't be offended when they decline. I was telling a friend of mine last night, Never, ever, ever do someone a favor for a reason. Because you will always end up with a resentment. And resentments are the number one offender. If you do something kind, whatever it is, whether that kindness is offering somebody the program, or it's running and getting them groceries, or whatever it might be, do it for fun and for free, like Chuck C. used to say. Don't do it tit for tat, quid pro quo, for a payoff. We don't need to do that. God's taking care of us. All of our needs are met. So we don't have to be calculating and manipulative and figure out which person we should do a favor for because that's the person who can give me validation. That's the person who can tell me I have permission to exist. Right? You do that, you try to get somebody to, to give you permission to exist. If I'll be nice to this person, then they'll thank me, and then I'll have permission to exist. 
And it never works out that way, does it? And then the worst thing that happens is you marry that person. <laughs> and you spend the rest of your life trying to get this person you live with to give you permission to exist. You become addicted to the drug called approval. But when we're in phase three, when we're in an ongoing spiritual experience, we have no need to try to curry favor with others, to try to get them to like us, to try to garner their approval. We can just be good to them because it's the right thing. And then no resentments. Amazing. No resentments. Just love. No disappointment, no drama. How boring. <laughs> I'm going to be taking off soon. I'm going to fly back to New York, God willing. At least that's my plan. And I know this weekend is going to continue. And I just want to make a personal request. If you don't realize it, I'm pointing it out to you. There is incredible power in this room. The stuff that happens here has the potential to affect the world. So in the spirit of carrying the message and giving away what's been given to us, I want to ask you, have in mind that whatever you gain is not for you. Whatever you gain, you're packing it up and bringing it back home and you're sharing it with whoever God decides that you're going to meet. Okay, that's it. That's what we got. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.